Hi everyone. Uh, I want to provide some updates and uh, and actually thank folks for what they've helped us achieve here over the last several years. So I'm going to jump right in to make this a short video. Um, first, our paper that came out in the summer I know generated a lot of discussion and, and people had lots of questions. And this is about the uh, germline CDH1 variants and gastric cancer risk. So I wanna talk about a few key takeaways from this paper. The first, if you just look at a large cohort of individuals and families with CDH1 mutations, what you're gonna see is that the prevalence of breast cancer and stomach cancer is about 17 and 14%. So this is in these boxes here. So in this study, there were uh, over 200 families, over 7,000 individuals. And if you look at the, the prevalence of stomach cancer and breast cancer in the folks with CDH1 variants, this is the number. And it's important, I want you to keep this 14% in mind, okay? 14% of people in this cohort had stomach cancer. Now, when we try to estimate risk, right? The models that we use have to incorporate real world data. So what we feed into the model is, hey, here's 14% of people that have stomach cancer with CDH1. But we wanna see what's the lifetime risk of stomach cancer if we tried to apply this to a, a broader population. And what we got was that the lifetime risk of stomach cancer might be in the seven to 10% range, 10% for men, 7% for women. Now the key to these data are that we define stomach cancer as people that had symptoms, walked into the doctor, got surgery, got chemotherapy. We specifically excluded anybody who had stomach cancer that was diagnosed as signet ring cells on an endoscopy for screening or signet ring cells diagnosed on a prophylactic total gastrectomy. Well, when we went through this process, the argument was, well, no, 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 you need to include all of those cases. You need to include every single case of signet ring cells diagnosed on an endoscopy, diagnosed on a prophylactic gastrectomy. So we did, and we got these numbers. So when you include every single diagnosis of stomach cancer, whether it's clinically relevant, or I think not totally relevant when you're finding signet ring cells on a random biopsy, these are the numbers we got. So probably somewhere in the 10 to 20% range. You can see the numbers for men were 19 to 20% lifetime risk, for females, 13 to 14% lifetime risk. Either way, what I take away from this is that your lifetime risk, if you have a CDH1 mutation, your lifetime risk of stomach cancer is maybe in the 10 to 20% range. That's about what the prevalence of stomach cancer was in this large cohort. So I think the fact that those numbers are in the same ballpark means that we're, we're on to something here, that this is probably much more reliable and more accurate than the old estimates of 60, 70, 80% that you guys have been told for many, many years. Now, the next part of this is, what does family history contribute? So I think the other takeaway from this paper is that if you're over here and you have a family history where you don't see any cases of stomach cancer. You're like, man, I found out about this CDH1 mutation because I got genetic testing for some other reason and I don't see anybody in my family with, with gastric cancer. Maybe your lifetime risk is low. This dot corresponds to about 10% lifetime risk. But we also know that there are families out there where there's lots of stomach cancer in the family. And so you, this pedigree is an example of three first degree relatives that were diagnosed with stomach cancer. And when we put this into the model, it says, well, maybe this individual who's unaffected right here, but has a CDH1 mutation, because they have three cases of stomach cancer in their family, maybe their lifetime risk is a bit higher. Maybe it's up here around 38%. So the takeaway from this is that, okay, maybe based on family history, your risk of stomach cancer could range. It could be on the low end of 10%, which by the way is still much higher than the general population, so it's still elevated. But it could be up to 40% depending on your family history. Now, I think this is a huge improvement based on where we were many years ago in terms of communicating 
risk. But my problem is, is, well, what if you walk into my office at the age of 40? You've already lived much of your life. So how do I communicate lifetime risk when you've lived a fair amount of that life already? So that was the next question we asked. Is, is there a different way to think about cancer risk? So I said, well, what if you're 40, you walk into my office? Here, we put this into a model that says, what's your risk based on your starting age, whether it's 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, or 70 years? And then what if we just look at your risk over the next 10 years? So if you look at this box, this is my example of the 40 year old that walks in, you see that it's 0.8 for men, 0.7 for women. So it's about 1%. So now I can start to think, okay, if you walk into my office at the age of 40 with CDH1, I can tell you that your lifetime risk of stomach cancer is in the 10 to 40% range based on your family history, or at least uh, taking into account your family history. But over the next decade, maybe we can say your risk is around 1% or maybe it's 2%, but it's not 40%, it's not 10%, right? We're just thinking over the next 10 years. And I think that's important, at least for me, to help understand what someone's cancer risk is. So the takeaways from this paper are, if you look at a large population of people with CDH1 mutations or families, you're gonna see stomach cancer around you know, 10 to 20%, right, prevalence. And oh, by the way, if we estimate lifetime risk, it's in the 10 to 40% range and maybe 40% on the high end if you've got lots of stomach cancer in your family and maybe your, your risk is maybe closer to 10% because in your family, we don't see a lot of stomach cancer, but you've got the CDH1 mutation and, and oh, by the way, you probably have those signet ring cells in your stomach and we'll talk about that in a minute. So the takeaways from this paper are, there's some more nuance involved. We gotta take into account your family history. We can't think about your risk as just like lifetime risk when you walk in the door and you've already lived half of that life. Now, this is where I wanna talk about how we even got to this point. And it's because people with CDH1 mutations, families came and saw us and participated in our research we published papers. Here's a list of papers. We published all these papers, but we couldn't have done that if people didn't come and participate in the research and share their family history and share their data. We could only do this because people, patients wanted to. And, and, and I think it's amazing. And this is what you all contributed. So I highlight a few here. The top one, we, we, we now know that active surveillance can be a reliable alternative to prophylactic gastrectomy. Many of you know this, many of you are under surveillance right now, but we didn't know that 10 years ago. We also know that the long-term consequences of prophylactic total gastrectomy are real. Physical consequences, psychological consequences, those of you that have had prophylactic gastrectomy, you know this. But we are able to share that now with other people because you came here and you helped us. We now are learning way more about these little signet ring cells and how they behave in the stomach, okay? Um, this is really important. This is gonna help us get to other things that are important like chemo prevention or the prevention of stomach cancer without having to do surgery. And then I just talked to you about the lifetime cancer risk. And this was our paper that came out earlier this year. And then I tried to kind of condense this into kind of a commentary or editorial that says, listen, now that we know all of this, my counseling of patients is much different now than it was 10 years ago. And I have less of an appetite to do gastrectomy, right? Because I want you to keep your stomach if you can. And I know that for some people, prophylactic gastrectomy is the way to go, but in some other people, maybe it's not. And so this editorial kind of speaks to that. But you've also contributed in ways that it's all hard for you guys to know. And so I wanna tell you how we assign pathogenic or likely pathogenic or benign, you know, uh, um, 
categories to these CDH1 mutations is through this variant curation panel or the VSEP. You guys don't know it, but we share this information to help make determinations as to whether or not a CDH1 mutation is likely to lead to higher risk of stomach cancer or not. And so your information, your data is valuable in that regard. And then lastly, the guidelines that really dictate how insurance companies even you know, reimburse for the care that people provide to people with CDH1, right? These guidelines are now incorporating a lot of this data that I just shared with you. So these updated guidelines that just came out earlier this year in, in the summer, a lot of it is because of the research that, that we published that you guys contributed to. And this is important. This changes the way that physicians, insurance companies look at how we manage people with CDH1 mutations. So we know more because of you. And I'm gonna go through these key things. We know and we are confident that 90 plus percent, probably almost all people with CDH1 mutations are walking the street, have these signet ring cells in their stomach, whether they're 15 years old or 50 years old. We know this with way more certainty now than we did again, 10 years ago. We know it, thanks to you. We know because of you that lifetime gastric cancer risk is much lower than previously described. Yes, your lifetime risk is higher than the average person because of CDH1, but it's not 70%, 80%, okay? Those, those numbers were from 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago. We now know because of you that active surveillance can be a safe alternative to prophylactic gastrectomy for many people and for many years. And again, many of you are under active surveillance and you know this. We know because of you that prophylactic gastrectomy has serious consequences and we have to take all of those into account when we're making these decisions together. This last part, these little signet ring cells, people call them T1A or whatever, they behave like precancers or pre-malignant lesions in people with CDH1 mutations. And we need to start acting or behaving that way, meaning when we find them, we, we don't need to reflexively say, oh, these are cancers that we need to jump on and treat with chemo and surgery. Because not in everybody, they're not going to, to turn into advanced cancer. And we need to start to understand the why and the how, right? But we, we've already started discussing as experts in the field that, boy, these seem to behave more like precancerous lesions than, than, than real cancer uh, uh, cases. And the national guidelines are changing. The national guidelines are catching up. And it's all because of you guys that have per participated in the research. So I don't do this alone here. These are some of the people that contribute. And, and, and I know that, that you know a lot of these people like I do, and, and, and it's really been a pleasure over the last several years to work with them. So with that, I wanna thank everyone. Uh, my face is covering up uh, Karen uh, Chelkin Schreiber, um, but thanks to everybody, and I hope this video helps.